Good evening, everyone, here from the beautiful island of Bermuda. It's the Bermuda Cricket Board bringing to you our first webinar of the 2021 cricket season. The season has yet to start due to the global pandemic known as COVID-19, but we are eager to bring information, hear your queries, and just showcase our beautiful island and what we have to offer to you. This is an international stream, and I'm pleased to be joined by none other than Mr. Gus Logie, a hero in his own right. Who is our thank former, you, thank you, thank you. Who is our former 2007 World Cup head coach, a former test player for the West Indies as a player and as a coach. The esteemed panel with us today is none other than the Honorable Premier of Bermuda, Mr. E. David Bright, JPNP, also Minister of Tourism. The Honorable Dr. Ernest Peets, the Minister of Youth, Culture and Sports. Our president, looking quite immaculate and smart there, Mr. Arnold Mendes, <laughs> former test, former cricket legend in his own right. And we are going to be joined, and may be joined by the Honorable Dr. Keith Mitchell, the Prime Minister of Grenada. He is currently engaged, and he may join us as well with Mr. Barry Collimore, who is the chairman of the Grenada Tourism Board. Um, gentlemen, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome, Mr. Premier. Um, to kick this off, let's just do it real light. Uh, this is a heavyweight panel. I think uh, if we were to play what you call it, Hong Kong Sixes, we'll be okay. So starting right off, Mr. Premier, um, in a brief sentence, what does cricket mean to you? Uh, cricket to me is, um, cricket is a sport that is, um, one that is very difficult to understand for most people, I would say, and put it on that level. And it's something that takes a while to get into. But cricket for me is knowing, uh, watching my father, and that's the first thing that comes into it. He was a huge cricket fan, uh, watched and spectate, and me as a young person trying to learn and to understand cricket. The memories it conjures up is this thing that we had in our house when I was really young. It was one of these boards that had all the various positions in football, uh, not in cricket, but, you know, silly bit on, silly bit off, right in front and all those things. So cricket to me uh, represents um, the, the memories it brings back to my father, but from a Bermuda perspective, certainly, um, it is a part of our culture. It's one of our two national sports. And from uh, that perspective, I think that it's something that um, it, it has a place in a lot of Bermudian hearts. I'll go to Mr. Mendes on a different um, opening remark or question. Taking Bermuda to another World Cup or having played having the opportunity to have played for the West Indies full test team. What, what would you like to see? Taking Bermuda to another World Cup. Okay, fantastic. And uh, I'd just like to um, thank the Premier, the Honorable David Burt, um, and the Minister of Youth, Culture, and Sports for joining us today. Um, and we hope that this is the first webinar of the year that we can just discuss the importance of cricket, but not only just cricket, but sports in general and how it builds character and can help a nation be happy. That's the main thing for me. I'm going to the Honorable Dr. Peets, Minister of Youth, Culture and Sports. A topic since we say it's sports in general. May I ask your cup match team? <laughs> Has always been St. George's. Uh, will always remain uh, St. George's. Um, St. George's uh, cricket team has been a part of uh, our family tradition for cup match uh, long, long before I was born. Uh, for me, what cricket represents, uh, for me, it's synonymous with summer. Uh, as a little kid, uh, we couldn't afford a cricket bat, so we used to cut one out of plywood or have someone cut one out of plywood. And as long as there was a tennis ball and a trash can somewhere, uh, that's what we did for summers. And uh, so cricket is a really, really important part of, of who we are as a people. I, I cannot re think of a childhood uh, that's not been touched by uh, cricket. Uh, as such, I'm really, really excited about the conversation that we're going to have tonight and, uh, and how we can push cricket going forward. Okay, I just got a phone call in my ear. Someone told me to ask you this question. St. George is winning the cup match for 10 years in a row, or Arsenal winning the treble? <laughs> I am not going to go on record <laughs> uh, with an answer uh, for that particular question. So I will, 
I, I will reserve comments uh, at the moment. <laughs> okay. Uh, and to Mr. Goslogi, uh, 2007 successful World Cup coach, having taken Bermuda to those heights for the very first and the only time. Just uh, what was your most memorable moment in cricket or thus far on a personal level? Well, first of all, Premier, the Honorable E. David Burke, the youngest Premier <laughs> on the island. My congratulations to you, uh, Dr. De Right Honorable uh, Ernest Dietz. Minister of Sports, congratulations as well. And I look forward to possibly, you know, a bit more conversation with you on sports in general in Bermuda. And of course, President of the BCB, Mr. Arnold Mendez, and of course, CEO, Mr. Carl. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I feel honored, I feel blessed just to be in your presence. My most memorable, as you say, memorable sport and event or activity or, you know, in, Playing for the West Indies, of course, is one of those things that as a young person you you aspire to. And I think if I can take, you know, a cue from the great Nelson Mandela, talked about sports in general, what it can do, it can change the world. Talked about it unites people, um, it inspires people. At the end of the day, that's the message the young people today can understand. So we really and truly are in a position where we can influence the young minds and not only in terms of on the field play but off because we really want to produce what you call model citizens and I think sports can do that for all of us. Okay and I note that the Honourable Prime Minister of Grenada Dr. Keith Mitchell is going to be joining us soon. It seems like he's aiming to log on. As soon as he joins us we will revert to him directly and pause with any further discussion points we are having. Um, since he's not joined us yet, let's make it uh, directly into the local aspect. Um, it's in pandemic, <clears throat> COVID-19. Um, the world has stopped or paused for some moments, but we know the importance of travel. And without travel, we do definitely notice the importance of sports as it still gives individuals something to look forward to, to celebrate, to discuss wins and losses. And as we bring it to a local level, how does that relate to us from a government side, the impact cricket has on the economy and the value that cricket brings into the cabinet boardroom when we are discussing the people of Bermuda? This goes directly to our youngest premier, the Honorable <laughs> David. I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely certain how it impacts this cabinet chamber where I'm in, except uh, for the arguments uh, that happen in the Somerset dominated cabinet, although recent changes have managed to switch that. Uh, but what I would say is that uh, cricket certainly uh, from a cultural perspective and certainly in an economic perspective is something that is beneficial. The largest holiday of the year, of course, is cup match. And it's, uh, and it's a holiday that is celebrating emancipation, uh, but around a cricket match between the West and the East and the Island, and something that uh, retailers and many businesses rely on for a significant economic boost uh, when it takes place. But I think on a broader level, and I think at a place where I think Bermuda can do more is on the issue of uh, when it comes to sport tourism and doing a more to make sure we can upgrade our national stadium and upgrade our national facilities so that we can have more cricket that is taking place here on island as well. Uh, we did have the, I think it was the tournament that took place uh, last year or the year before last. Um, it was 2020, you know, it was all a blur. The tournament took place the year uh, before last. And I think that we need to try uh, to make sure that we can host more events like that in Bermuda. Uh, to have more people exposed to cricket in a younger generation. The historical measure of cricket is uh, one that I think we'll get to uh, with the Prime Minister, but it's important that cricket is kept in its historical context. Thank you very much. Um, just going to try to reach out to the, the Honourable Dr. Keith Mitchell, Prime Minister of Grenada. Dr. Mitchell, welcome. Well, good evening, good afternoon. Um, yeah, I, I got mixed up that hour and forgot you were just an hour. <laughs> before us so but i'm glad to be here and glad to be part of this important discussion thank you very much and you're not late cricket is a game played with 11 and so if you're bringing uh, uh, coming in last man you have well, a valuable well, well I, I i was i was watching the west indies game there too well. that's <laughs> part of my part of my problem i always like a live game <laughs> thank you sir uh, we started this panel's discussion off with what does cricket mean to you? And I would like to pose that question to you as well. What does cricket mean to you on a personal level? 
Well, um, growing up in my own country, the, the major sport was, was in fact, um, cricket and soccer. And uh, I began to love the game of cricket, playing on the beaches and on the road during, during the period growing up. We didn't have a playing field as such, but we used every little trip available to play. And that was the, that was the game that excited us as young people. And in those days, you had the, the West Indies, of course, was at the top of world cricket and, and being a proud West Indian. You follow the game, the, the Gary Sobers, the, the Rowan Kanhai, West Hall, and the guys who excited us. And of course, I remember getting up early in the morning, watching, listening, not watching, listening, because those days, no television. You had some, some, some radio and you had to be boxing the radio all the time to get the cockroaches out. <laughs> to listen to the game up in down, 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 down um, Australia, like Frank Warrell leading the West Indies team in the 61 period, that 62. So uh, that, the cricket was an a important part of the culture of the country. And in, in school, going to school, that, that was an important part of the curriculum. We, we broke off um, sometime during the day of, high, of primary school to play cricket. So it was really part of the life the social life of the people. On a Sunday, and a Sunday growing up in the village I grew up, I mean, when, when a cricket match is being played, it's like a, a festival. The, all the ladies are dressed in all the colors and, and the, the guys are out there, everybody out there selling different things to eat and drink. It was like a real community spirit. So cricket was an essential part of the my upbringing and that's why I got to love the game and started playing early and, and develop the skills throughout the period I was going to primary school and then secondary school. So it was really part of our life, so to speak. Thank you very much, sir. Um, I'm going to pose another question to you. Um, we had the Premier of Bermuda speak to this a few minutes before you came online. Um, the impact cricket has economically on the, on Grenada or in Grenada, does it have an economic impact, the game of cricket? Yes, uh, uh, absolutely. So um, we, we see we we have um, the, the the West Indies team, of course, being at the height of the pinnacle of West, of world cricket at the time. Um, whenever a touring team came to the country. You had thousands of visitors, particularly the English team. They brought in thousands of visitors. And of course, the, the, the economic spin-off of that was, was tremendous <clears throat> in every respect. And of course, um, most of the, the business, com um, team, um, business organization in the country helped to organize um, sporting at cricket activities and supporting a lot of cricket competition, and they brought in teams from different countries. There were activities, whether it was the, the, the police club cricket throughout the Caribbean islands, whether it was in fact the banks playing each other, and um, whether it was a competition between schools. I don't know if Gus looking at seems there. I see Gus is there. I remember. And I remember I, Prime Minister, sir. Yes, <laughs> yes, sir. <Ronnie. laughs> I followed you a lot, Gus. I remember going to play for, for, I was, uh, went to a presentation college in Grenada. And um, we had this competition between Presentation College in Grenada and, and San Fernando. So the first time I, I got a plane ride was going from Trinidad Grenada to Trinidad and going to San Fernando. So that mixed uh, that communication and relation, built, built relationship among people. And that, uh, of course, represented question of, of touring teams coming to different countries and, and brought in a lot of resources, made an interaction between people in the Caribbean in, in, a, in a general sense. I remember there was no, the first class teams in Barbados used to play regular touring matches in Grenada. So when I was playing for Grenada, they came to Grenada consistently over the years and, and therefore brought a, a lot of their family and friends. So it really was, and it, there was serious economic spin-off. I don't forget the fact that sports is such an important part of the development of young people. That, that, that co correlation between sport and education helped to develop the minds of the young people of the country. And, uh, and, uh, and therefore, you, 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 you saw that, that 
whole development of our young people um, because of sports, right? We played a major part in shaping the minds of our, our young people of our country. And I think it, it, to some extent, it had a lot to do with my own development, I, I, I must say so. Yes, sir. Um, sorry. Thank you very much, Dr. Keith Mitchell. Um, turning my attention to the Honorable Minister of Youth, Culture, and Sports, how does cricket play a role in shaping the culture and also the heritage in Bermuda? When we look from a historical context to where we are going now with a very vibrant youth demographic. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, that's, a, that's a really good question. Actually, most Bermudians uh, won't have any trouble answering that particular question. Um, as our as, uh, Honorable Premier has already indicated, uh, uh, Cup Match is our premier sporting event of the year. Uh, but is also uh, attached to one of our most important uh, pieces of heritage as relates to who we are as a people, particularly around emancipation. The fact that cricket is associated with Emancipation Day uh, really, in my opinion, uh, puts uh, cricket in a very elevated position uh, as relates to uh, uh, other sports. Uh, what it means to us uh, regarding our, our heritage and our culture is, is something that's important. Um, cricket, of course, is introduced uh, very, very early uh, in our children's lives. It's, it's a part of, of who we are. As I mentioned earlier, I can't think of a summer without thinking about cricket. Uh, that's how synonymous uh, cricket uh, is. Uh, I'm certainly disappointed right now that um, you know, COVID is uh, preventing us uh, from returning back to play, but hopefully uh, the situation will turn around uh, soon. Uh, and we can see uh, cricket uh, once again in the fashion and the form in which we're used to. Uh, but to answer your question, uh, cricket uh, has uh, been around uh, our culture, around our people uh, for as long as history uh, has been around as well. So I'm certainly excited about uh, the, the potential that cricket has uh, in our youth uh, as we continue to push uh, cricket going forward. Thank you. Oh. And, to, and to Mr. Logie, we know that for us on the panel, we all know the passion that the West Indies brings to the entire region. But this is an international platform for persons from the United States, et cetera, where cricket may not be a number one sport. Can you speak to the importance of cricket and how that shapes the culture and heritage from your aspects from the West Indies as a former national team test match playing um, captain player? If I have to piggy bank on the right honorable Keith Mitchell's statement about what it did for him as a youngster, I can say when we were also in school in Trinidad and Tobago, cricket was such an important entity that whenever the West Indies team came to Trinidad, mm -hmm. you got a day off to actually go and see the games. But living in the Southland, it was always difficult to get to the Oval. So we played our own games in our backyards and the Savannas. And we would take on the personas of the touring teams that came, the names of the individuals, the, 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 some of the Clive Lloyds, the Viv Richards, you know, the Garfield Subas, as Dr. Michelle alluded to. Then, of course, you had the Indians come into the Caribbean. And then, of course, in Trinidad and Tobago, because of the cultural differences in, in, in Trinidad and Tobago or the split, you would then take on the persona for Gavaska or Vensaka. So cricket for, for us, it was endemic, in, you know, growing up, that the belief system as well, it, it engendered in us, uh, the confidence it built in us, the high self-esteem, the teamwork, the healthy lifestyles, all the benefits that you can get from actually being involved in the game is what I believe that it's very important going forward for young people to be involved. It yeah. teaches you responsibility. It teaches you it teaches having you. strong work ethic. You know, it promotes leadership. All the things that we saw in those individuals then we wanted to emulate those guys. We wanted to be like them. We also felt it very important. Cricket must be important to, to our psyche if you can get a day off from school to go and watch cricket. And I think that's something that you want to be able to share, you know, with Bermudians, with the Americans. you got to love it, but there must be some input from the authorities, the powers that be, to suggest that the game itself is important, not just from an economical standpoint, but what it can actually do for the young people, the psyche of the young people. Yeah. When I came to Bermuda, 
And the, the, the objective was, can you get us to a World Cup? The belief system that you felt the players, the supporters, and everyone should have wasn't actually as evident. But as you went on and you started to interact with the individuals and you started to show them what the benefits could be if you are successful, what it meant, it meant improved facilities, it meant opportunities to travel, it meant opportunities for educational trips. And many of the individuals started to buy into that sort of belief system and what was at the end of the day's history, they did it. And I think many of the players today who, have, who were involved at the time can attest to the struggles, yes. Um, yeah. Some of the disappointments, yes. That's all part and parcel of, of, of getting to where you want to. But that dream and that belief system must be inculcated in the young players from early. And it has to come not just from the coaches around, but from the authorities, the powers that be, must see it as more than just possibly a stroll in the park. All right. Hey, uh, Kellen, I was wondering if I can add something to... Um to the conversation based on the question you previously asked. Definitely. It, it, it just came to me and I, I do apologize for interjecting. Um, Brian, Laura and I are not far apart in age. I think we may be about a year apart, but I remember in, in the late nineties and early two thousands uh, when he was playing, um, my family uh, is from St. Kitts, uh, but Bermuda of course, geographically, you know, it's geographically, I, some people can argue that we're a bit isolated. Uh, but when the West Indies were playing in the 90s and when Brian Lauer uh, broke the world record, we were so, I was so happy. I mean, I, I think that event, at least in my mind anyway, at that particular time in, in my early 20s, we all felt West Indian. That, 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 that type of pride and that type of, of situation was, was something I can't forget. And on my, my first trip to Trinidad and Tobago, I, I asked uh, uh, the persons who were sharing this around, can, can you take me to Santa Cruz? Uh, because uh, I want to see uh, where, where, where Brian Lara had his first start. I mean, that, that, that's how important cricket is, not just in the Caribbean, uh, but also around the entire, around the entire world. It's, 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 it's just really amazing how many lives uh, cricket can touch. But if we're discussing culture, I think that it's important because as Dr. Mitchell <clears throat> um, had said, we have to look at the historical context of uh, cricket and what it represents, uh, certainly in the West Indies and even how interesting it's intersected to Bermuda. Uh, we can look at, uh, of course, Bermuda when it comes to cup match, but of course the dominant time for the West Indies in cricket was a time where basically it was most a symbolic and actual resistance against white oppression. And we should call it what it is. We, it, it, it was, you know, the West Indies battling, you know, whether it's South Africa, whether it was England, whether it was Australia. And, you know, it was and it was the context of that. So it's interesting how that merges with the cricket cultural context in Bermuda, where it's around cup match, et cetera. And that's the highlight, the pinnacle when we're talking about the glory years of the West Indies, certainly, and the battle in the 80s when it was, you know, certainly uh, going up against uh, and those teams, and, you know, whether it was playing in South Africa, uh, you know, the time when there was apartheid still. And, uh, and so it's important to recognize and understand, I think, the historical context. And, of course, it's a little bit more dull now. It's not as it was once, you know. Uh, just in certain ways, things ebb and flow. But the, well, the real thing, it's important to recognize the historical context of what cricket represents and the emotional and cultural context of uh, the history. Let, let me, can I intervene a little bit there just, just to make a point? Am I, can I yes, that? sir. I, I, I want to talk about just a bit of, of what cricket meant to, to a Caribbean man, to a Grenadian to Barbadian or Trinidad. And I, having gone to school and studied abroad and a different, well, it's North America, I studied in England, I studied in North America and so on. And I've been lived in the Caribbean and was born there. You felt really proud as a Caribbean man when the West Indies team was at the height of its uh, pinnacle of, of world cricket. You walked into classrooms and your, your chest is up because the, the guys were making you so proud. Because with all the racism and 
the, the cultural problems that we had over the years. And when our team was doing well, it lifted our spirit as Caribbean people. So it was, it, sometimes you watch what is happening now and you get the impression, guys don't seem to understand the importance of that game, to the mindset and the character and the feeling of, of, of Caribbean people. Uh, and I, I know, I, I saw guys in the past who will cry when they, when they lose and Gus would understand this because they know what it meant to their people. It was more than a game. It was a, a way of life, a way of a pride and joy that you, 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 you got, the feeling of, 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 of success, the feeling of being. Uh, I, I give you an, an example. I've been in, in, in England watching a test match between West Indies and England. And um, P.J. Patterson as Prime Minister of Jamaica and myself for the VFV box with the MCC guys. And the game was going on. And <laughs> we were there having a drink and we heard a little noise. West Indies was batting. The next thing we know, West Indies almost <laughs> all out. P.J. told me, He's, he, look, he's getting a cap because he don't want to walk out there to be seen. So he said to me after I got him, I was with the kids, hey, you know, they, with that big cap, literally talking, a fella bought me a pigeon. <laughs> I mean, that is to tell you how he's my prime minister. <laughs> a prime minister is, is conducting himself that way. I, I remember also going to Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting and Prime Minister John, John Howard of Australia and was in an Australia plane. And every time there's a break, he either teasing me or I'm teasing him. That's that's how it, what it meant. I, I can't forget a match. West Indies playing, I think it's Australia. They were one more wicket to go. Walsh and, Walsh and, um, and you know, Walsh is not the greatest of batsman. And Lara, I know you guys remember that game. Look, the whole Caribbean stopped working. The whole Caribbean. Oh, you're not a call me from Barbados. Keep what you're doing. Cabinet, all cabinet out. All public servants. <laughs> At that time, no one thinking about productivity because Caribbean, that cricket meant so much to us as a people. So this is not a joke. I think the young people have to understand the significance of that game and what it meant to Caribbean people, to every part of the region. That's why this concept of whether you're Trinidad and Ray Barbie, what, what Caribbean people want, the best team. They're not interested, generally speaking. You have the, the selfish elements in each of those countries, but generally speaking, what people want, the best team, because when, they, when the best team goes out and they win, all of us get in credit. I, I just wanted to make that point because of the importance. And another point I really want to make on this, and a heads of government meeting, the Prime Minister of Bahamas, um, Terry Christie, told us, he was going to school in, in London, and he said, he, the Bahamas doesn't play much cricket, but as a Caribbean man, he felt so proud as a Caribbean person when he went to, to classes and uh, West Indies did well. While Bahamas wasn't playing much cricket, he felt so proud as a Caribbean man coming out, going and out of classroom and having to deal with his English brothers and sisters. So I'm making the point and I'm stressing it. We, we, have, to, we, we have to get to our young people more and more to understand the value of cricket in the Bermuda, for example, and all over the Caribbean. And we should use our legends. We don't use them enough. That's one of the, I think, the weakness of our system. We have all these guys have done so much for West Indies cricket. At the end of the time when they finish, we forget them. You know, you don't have to hear about some of them. Some of them end up as paupers. And we forget that they, they did so much for us and they made us feel so proud. And they enriched our Caribbean um, family so much. And I think it's something that we have to continuously remember. I am one of those who feel strongly about this. And, and I I'll constantly tell our, our people that we, we need to not just give credit to those who struggle. Some of them had to make so much sacrifice to play for the country and to play for the region. In those days, many of those days, the guys were not making any money, but the pride of playing for the Caribbean, of being so proud as a Caribbean man. 
give them that feeling that they must go there and do their best. Thank you very much, Dr. Keith Mitchell. This is a great segue into our next discussion point. And we have coaches and players online. They, they listen to the heads of state and administrators, but we, the players on the field and the coaches give us all the passion and pride and success. And to Mr. Gus Logie and President Mendes, the next topic is the importance of having a robust domestic competition. And that will be followed by the value of having those domestic players represent the country internationally. Um, if you want to speak to that, we'll go to President Mendes first, the, the, the role of the domestic competition. You're muted, Arnold. Well, that's where it starts. The, the strength of, of any program is your know, domestic competition. If you remember when we were one of the top associates, it's when we had a Super 8 league and every team could play against each other. And you could be in first and play the last place team. If you didn't have your A game, you were going to lose. Um, we need to try and improve uh, domestic leagues because, as I said, that's where it starts. Uh, the problem I see that we're having uh, with this present generation is that their skill level is not as high as it should be um, when they move up into the international level. So uh, we're currently putting together a strategic plan, five-year strategic plan in place so that we could increase the participation, particularly with the youngsters, and improve our club structure so that when players move from out of the club and come into the high performance program, it's not that big of a jump. Um, so domestic competition is the future of being what we did in 2007, which was qualifying for the World Cup. Um, and the next year we qualified for the under 19 World Cup. And when you talk about history, Bermuda is the smallest country in the world to ever qualify for a World Cup. 90% of, well, I wouldn't say 90, but at least 80% of the countries playing in the ICC now have more than 60,000 cricketers. So that is a big achievement for us. We have, we're deep in history when you think about it and you think about cup match where uh, a, a country shuts down literally for three, four days because of a sporting event. Um, and that comes, and that started in 1901. Um, we, for a small island, we pack a, a, a big punch. And like we said, domestic competition is probably going to be the best thing that we could do in our strategic plan, is to improve the domestic cricket to assist us when we move into the international arena. Thank you. If I may just piggyback on what Arnold is saying, in order to have um, a good domestic competition in terms of improving the players, which is really and truly what you want. The more competent players you have, the more confident they will be. And of course, the better performances you will see. And of course, that has its own spin-off. I think you then you have players who then move from your club teams into your cup match teams and then into your national setup. But what you want to produce and how you're going to do that is going to depend a lot on asking yourself simple question as to what you know excellence in cricket on the island should already look like and of course it will come back to one you're talking about facilities it, you will need good playing surfaces if you want to produce the best batters possibly the best bowlers the best fielders you have to provide the surfaces that they can really and truly utilize to the best of their ability you will need to then have a good upgrade in umpiring, you have to, in coaching, these things have to be upgraded so that they're giving the young players the best of themselves and the best knowledge, what is happening out there. Remember in the days where the cricket formats have changed. And maybe in, when I was here seven, 10, 15 years ago, you, you talk about playing the four day game. We had continental game. So you had to play three day games to get yourself used to that. Now it's about 50 overs, it's just about T20 and even going into T10. Yeah. 
So the type of player that you have to now develop takes a different mindset, different skill set. So you have to do upgrading of everything, your governance structure, everything, the development program, they have to be varied. The competitions have to be varied. And all those will cost money. So you need to get sponsors on board. So you really have to create that right image for the sponsors as well to be on board. So the players need to understand very early that they themselves have to change their mindset and understand that in order to get from point A to point B to raise the level, it will take a lot of commitment. It will take a lot of you know, sacrifices as the Honorable Keith Mitchell said, you have to sacrifice something in order to get to that level. As the cricket board, I, I can only encourage you to share that vision, share the vision with everyone because you gotta get everyone involved. It's not gonna be something that can happen in isolation. You need to get everyone on board players, coaches, family, friends, you know, everyone on board that can buy into this vision. And at the end of the day, if you can, the unity will be there. One of the things I've always said when I was here with a young team is that you talk about unity is strength, but what is the glue that keeps that unity together? It has to be what you call agreement. So we all need to agree that this is where we want to go. And I'm certain once that can happen, there's enough talent in the island to be able to, to go forward with. Totally agree. Taking into consideration that the Honorable Dr. Keith Mitchell may have to leave us uh, yes. due to yes. another engagement, I'm going to take it to the topic on sports tourism. So to the Honorable Premier Brett and to the Honorable Dr. Keith Mitchell, what role does cricket play from a sports tourism perspective? As we know, we're trying to grow tourism in our regions, one of our main economic indicators and uh, initiatives to keep both islands vibrant. And if you can speak to that, the role of sports tourism and cricket as a whole. Yes, um, thank you. And I'm, uh, I'm sorry I do have to this discussion on, on cricket. That's really part of my my life. I, so I hate to have to leave you at another appointment. But I just want to comment briefly on, on the, the, your structure and club and your cricket. I was being discussed a while before I deal with the issue you just asked me. I, one of the things I, I would advocate strongly, and I've been preaching that here and trying to get the own cricket board in Grenada to follow that, that formula. The school cricket, don't underestimate the importance of this. That is where the, the kids get to understand and develop a passion for, for the game. I always look to my, my own son, despite all my interest in cricket and trying to learn him. There isn't that... that that attempt, attempt to involve the young people enough at the level of school cricket. When I went to secondary school, we had we had competition among houses. And I mean, keen competition. And then you had also competition among the schools. And I mean, and we had the, the girls weren't playing cricket, but the girls follow certain school. And they came out in large numbers. And when you see the girls around, you want, you want to be there. So there was this excitement. The game brought a lot of a lot of feelings. So I want to I want to stress school cricket and the club cricket. I think I think it's it to me to some extent I find it's not as vibrant as it used to be. Certainly not so in my own country. Um, we we had a lot more activities with less facilities, but a lot more more club activities throughout the length and breadth of the country during my time of growing up than it is to be. So I want to just ask you, as far as this year of sports tourism, there's no doubt about it. The, we can see the impact of, of sports and cricket in, in particular from all levels. As I mentioned before, the, the competition that has been initiated by various groups throughout the Caribbean has brought a lot of visitors to our country. It has enormous impact on, on, the, on the economic aspect of, of, of our individual countries. We, we have the case, case of the police clubs, they have competition. And I mean, whenever the teams are coming to individual countries, scores and scores of police officers and their families travel. And all the banks, and the different, different organizations. So it brings it, and it has an added dimension, eh? we, because we talk a lot of the single market and economy, but we don't, in the region, we don't, we don't interact enough. And therefore, the more we can get people to, 
to, to, to involve in sporting activities, it's a way of getting that co communication contact going much more than we have today. So I, I think that is important. And clearly, at the different levels, the, the, the different competition that has been um, undertaken in, among the islands and the different um, organizations, um, competition within the West Indies Cricket Board that brings in lots of visitors, not as we have now, because clearly the pandemic has affected the life of every single aspect of life in, in the Caribbean as a whole. And then, as I mentioned before, when we, we're looking forward to the, 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 English team, uh, the, the Indian team, the Australian team coming to Grenada, um, I remember the last World Cup, but they had a, a, a few matches in Grenada. And we couldn't find spaces, hotel space to put people. People used to be housing people in their homes. <laughs> a lot of people made a lot of money. When, when they left, every people, they meet you and say, man, look, I have a, a bunch of Australian dollars. I have a bunch of New Zealand dollars. Guys, were, there was excitement because of the economic spinoff that it brought to the, to the average man, not just the, the big, big hoteliers, the average man throughout the length and breadth of the country. So there's no doubt in my mind, Premier, there's no doubt in my mind that this um, developing the sport more in Bermuda and in every island in the Caribbean have enormous spin-off, economic spin-off for every single Caribbean country. And, and it has enormous implication for the Caribbean image as a whole. So friends, I, wa I want to thank you for this opportunity and I look forward, um, President of the Bermuda Cricket Board and my friends, I, 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 I did travel to Bermuda at one of some time in the past, a good long time ago. And I look forward in the future to come by. I can't play the game again. Um, we do have some some over 60 games and I'm over 70 now, so I don't think we would have <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about you, but I, I am I'm a spectator now. I, I am a spectator as well, too, sir. <laughs> all, all of, <laughs> All the best, guys. Take care of yourselves. Thank Take you. Take care, Dr. Mitchell. Take care. All right. Thank you, Dr. Mitchell. And we will reach out exactly. to you offline. There are some important questions that came to you uh, interested in the life in Grenada as a whole. We'll send yes. them to your personal assistant and then we'll look for that feedback that we can share with the international audience. Thank you very much for joining us. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So I want to thank Dr. Mitchell for joining us, the Prime Minister of Grenada, who is very passionate about his country and cricket as a whole. And we'll go back to our Honorable Premier and speak to sports tourism and the role cricket players or can play in increasing that um, avenue for Bermuda. Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, I, I, I am, I can say that uh, Dr. Mitchell captain his Grenada cricket team before I was born. <laughs> so he's been doing this for quite some uh, time. Uh, the, the, uh, from a Bermuda perspective, certainly we can, we're not like uh, the islands where we have very large cricket stadiums um, and, you know, part of you know, um, the, the, those setups. And so from our perspective, sport tourism will have to be at smaller competitions, worried about uh, dealing with things in the area of training. We have to be realistic as the capacities of which we have, but that should not stop us from aspiring uh, to do more. I think from a sport tourism perspective, I think that our, our, the, the biggest sport tourism thing for cricket is cup match. And I don't want to keep going back to cup match, but the fact is that that is something that we continue to market year after year after year, because the fact is that it is a unique cultural experience. That is something uh, that does expose persons to cricket, but also exposes persons to the unique culture uh, of Bermuda. So from a sports source perspective, our focus will certainly have to be smaller on training, on smaller competitions like what was held um, a couple of years ago, with the IC qualifiers, and it's those type of things I think where we have to be directed and focused on in Bermuda. Thank you. I'm going to go back to the 2007 World Cup as we have our successful coach here, Mr. Gus Logie, and also the President Mendes, who would have been part of that setup as well. Um, Mr. Logie, we went to the World Cup, there was a euphoria, there was a hype, um, getting there was a success in its own right. We returned, cricket has not returned to that level, but what did that do for Bermuda and what do we need to do to get back to that level? I think even before the 2007 World Cup itself, I think the journey started long before that. You're talking about qualifiers in Ireland, you're talking about 2005 right. qualifiers, you know. I came to Bermuda um, 
at the end of, I think, September, October of uh, 2004. In fact, I had a team in Trinidad and Tobago training before that. And, you know, as I said before, the belief when I went into the room the first time and I saw the guys and I said to them, look, how many of you believe you can actually qualify for a World Cup? And of course, I was expecting to get a show of hands of everyone, but it didn't actually materialize. There were just a few guys, but a few guys who did it, the Slavos, the Clay Smiths, um, the Romains, these, those and the general talkers, those guys believed in themselves so much that they said, look, we can. And I said, once you can, we can work together. And of course, that journey started from there. And of course, by the time I got back to Bermuda with the squad, they, we said there were a few things that we needed to you know, change. There were a few things we needed to improve upon. Um, and the fitness level, we need to improve that. We need to improve a bit of the skill sets. And we, 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 we created a of action that incorporated not just on the cricket field, but off the field. We got involved in so many things in the community you know, which was very important for the guys to get that confidence, to get out there, to interact with their community, interact, you know, with different organizations. And of course, you know, it's, it's snowball. Of course, there will always going to be the people who will say you couldn't make it, you won't make it. In fact, I remember going to Bailey's Bay while here and a gentleman presented me with a list and it was a completely new list of players. And, I, and he said to me, look, you know, don't worry about the guys you have now. This is the guy you should be carrying. And, and some names were, were 16 year olds, 17 year olds. You know, as far as he was concerned, these are the people you should be focusing on, not the, those other guys. But history, at the end of the day, have this it could, could repeat itself. I do believe that the opportunity is still there for the players to, you know, make it again to another World Cup. If not to another World Cup, but certainly get up the rankings so that more funding can come into the setup. You know, more opportunities are out there. There are so many T20 international leagues out there now that your players can get the opportunity to play abroad, which will broaden their own horizon, which will improve their own cricket, then they can come back and share their experiences. I think right now you have a young man who is in England playing young Rollins, and he's been getting quite a lot of airplay. A lot is expected of him in that, in that environment. There's a young Levrock as well. These are young players who would have seen the Lionel Cans and the Levrocks and the Romain graduate. You know, so if we can get those players who would have taken us to a World Cup, who would have done well for Bermuda to go back into the school system, talk to the youngsters, motivate them, you know, um, inspire them, tell their stories, you know, some of the challenges they would have faced, how they overcome it, because it's about adapting and overcoming. And I think these are very important lessons that the young ones coming up can learn from. And you can have that continuity. And said before, I think it's important. We, we have to develop the mindset that, yes, you are a small nation, but it doesn't mean you cannot punch above your weight. That's right. You have done it before. But the encouragement must be there. The support must be given. You know, I think it's important for the young athletes when they go there, they feel they get the support of the community, they get the support of the parents, they get the support of the government, they get the support of the board, and they get the support all around so that we could, you know, empower them to make the right choices. Because I can tell you at the end of the day, sports in itself, it really lifts you as an individual. And, you know, some of the social layers that you might be having, who knows, you can get those youngsters away from that. It gives you second chances. You know, so I believe it's important to, to, as you say, start with the young people, going to the schools, having conversations with them. And I think you have the people on board here in Bermuda who have been at the highest level. They have the knowledge to share. I think we should reach out to them so that they can really and truly share that knowledge of what that World Cup experience was like. And can we do it again? I think you can. Thank you. I want to welcome Mr. Barry Collimore, who's joined us. He is the chairman of the Grenada Tourism Authority, and he is also the director and partner of West Indies Management Company, a company involved in hotel, hotel and tourism development in Grenada. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And, Thank you for joining us. We did some discussions I, on tourism, sports tourism, and the impact of cricket, but as being the head of the tourism authority, you would definitely know those figures and numbers and the value of that. So. <laughs> What does it yeah. mean to you in, this, in, in the hot seat of tourism? How valuable is cricket uh, in the region or in Grenada? 
from a tourism aspect? Well, it's valuable all around. Thank you again for uh, inviting me. It's, it's, it's valuable all around, um, gentlemen. And um, let me just say um, good afternoon to, to you all and, and to your uh, listeners and nice meeting you. It's valuable all around in, in many respects. Let's, you know, um, uh, Gus, um, my friend who, who worked with us in uh, Grenada on the uh, Shell Cricket <laughs> Academy, uh, knows, knows uh, we, we worked together years ago on yes, the cool. first Cricket Academy in, in Grenada. Gus was the head coach. Um, cricket, uh, unfortunately, and, and, and he was just talking about uh, the young people. Unfortunately, um, in a lot of instances, we have left cricket only to the professionals. Um, cricket needs to be played again in the West Indies for fun. People need to start socializing around cricket again. Uh, we need to have more prepared pitches. Uh, we, need, we need to, if in many countries across the Caribbean, if you, uh, if you wanted to have a game of hardball cricket, I'm not talking about wind ball, you wouldn't know where to go to get a prepared pitch. I'm talking about the average man. And cricket has been left too much to the clubs. There is, there is too much dependence on the clubs uh, are the ones who are playing the cricket and it's not in the villages and the neighborhoods and the schools and so on. And we in the Caribbean have, uh, in, in many respects, have, uh, have uh, moved out a lot of times, moved out from the village where we have grown up and moved to somewhere else. Many people um, migrate for one reason or the other. And uh, so that means that the, the, the communities are not as close knit as they used to be. But it's really important that cricket uh, did more than just uh, put us on the map. It kept us fit, it, it, uh, it kept us healthy. Um, and we need to start looking at cricket again as a game of fun and a game that will keep us healthy and living longer and keep our families together uh, as we socialize around cricket. Because my parents and uh, and, and your parents and, and, uh, and, and uncles and aunts played cricket, they socialized, the boys socialized in communities um, with, with cricket. So that's the first thing. I, I think that the social aspect of cricket has been lost in, in, in many parts of the Caribbean. It's important to keep us fit and it's important to bring our communities um, together. And, 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 and most importantly for the professional team called the West Indies team, uh, if you have less people playing cricket across the Caribbean, you have less of a talent pool. So that's one of the things that we need to address. We need to get people playing cricket again. In terms of a tourism um, perspective, it's vitally important. Uh, there is no greater uh, tourism ad uh, in the Caribbean, and there's no greater, um, uh, perhaps the only thing that people know the West Indies for more than our cricket is Bob Marley. So it's Bob Marley than cricket. And the, and the, uh, the path that uh, uh, persons like Gus and, and, and uh, the other greats would have done, they would have done more for tourism than any board of tourism in the Caribbean, past or current or future. Uh, West Indies cricket has put the Caribbean on the map. And we need to realize the value of it. It put us there in the past and it can put us there again. We need to rally around our, our current team. We need to get together, stop the fight and stop the insularity and realize this great asset that we have called cricket. It is the answer for many things. If you look at what is happening next year with, uh, with tourism, for instance, the England tour is coming up uh, of the Caribbean. This is fantastic. You may have, and we could have a situation where large numbers of English people are traveling in the Caribbean. There is nothing to bring back confidence to the tourism market and to traveling again, like, like a potential uh, England tour. So um, I, I, I think cricket is vitally important on many, many levels. I think we undervalue it. I think we underrate our cricketers. Um, uh, I, um, and, and we are focused on, in, in many respects, on the wrong things. Um, and I think we have to realize this jewel that we have. If any other region in the world had what we had as a legacy, 
they would treat it much better than we've treated it. So I, I just wanted to, well, I really, really believe in cricket. I believe we have to get back to the fundamentals. We have to, to get back to the, to the reason why people know about um, uh, West in, the West Indies. And we have to look at uh, where cricket has taken us in the past and where it can take us in the future. Sorry to be so lengthy, but I'm really passionate about this. And, and, uh, and I'm really pleased to see um, my friend Gus on because he's, he, he, when we started the Cricket Academy, he was the head coach. And he played a fundamental role. In, 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 um, and, and this is something that we had envisioned that we would have academies throughout the Caribbean, uh, bringing lots of people, to, not just with the professional training, but the, the average young man who uh, may have some talent, but his talent may not be developed at age 15. It may be developed at age 17 or 18. But you bring him in to play cricket and, and young lady, not just the men. So so that's that that's how I you know this thing is, is, is really powerful. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. <laughs> um gonna go back to the honorable premium. Just want to make sure we don't lose him if he has to depart. There's a few questions that have come from the international audience, but this is gonna be a local one. Uh signature skills, the hot topic. Uh, with the Bermuda about to implement signature schools, is there a place for cricket, a one-stop cricket academy, et cetera? Any comments on that? Well, I'm going to give you a very good politician answer that I'm not going to uh, preempt <laughs> the Minister of Education, who I think spoke on signature schools on Wednesday. But what I can refer back to is our election platform where we spoke about signature schools, and we said that they will focus on the learning styles and interests of our students, including sports. So there is certainly the um, desire for there to be one of our signature schools, which will be one <clears throat> which will have a sports signature um, inside of it. So there's no question about that. And we need to find the best place for that. But that is a consultative exercise that is taking place. But the short answer to the question is yes. Uh, I cannot declare exactly what that is or where it may be. But there will be um, uh, one of our, at least one of our schools that has a sports signature inside of it. Thank you. And to the Honorable Dr. Peets and President Mendes, uh, a question from our local community. What is the intention of the Department of Youth and Sports and the Bermuda Cricket Board to get more girls and women involved in the game of cricket? And are we trying to increase the funding or any support for women and girls to be part of the game of cricket? Before they answer, I can say one thing. I know that my daughter plays cricket in public school at Northland Primary, so there's a start there. <laughs> Dr. Peets, I'll hand it over to you first. Sure, thank you. Um, I actually had to switch to the headphones so I could really, really listen in on, on the dialogue. Hopefully the audio is working okay. All right, terrific. Uh, I certainly uh, appreciate all the sentiments that have been shared thus far. Uh, and I fully endorse the whole idea of, 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 of seeing cricket played more often, kids falling in love with cricket. As I mentioned earlier, when we began the dialogue earlier, every summer, we'd be out in the yard, out in the neighborhood, cricket bat, tennis ball, a trash can. That's how we enjoyed our summers. And um, I don't see a lot of that uh, these days. Uh, things have changed, of course, with our young folks, uh, but our love and our passion uh, for cricket uh, hasn't diminished uh, one little bit. Uh, regarding the, the conversation about uh, girls' cricket, uh, we're, of course, uh, 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 mandated to uh, develop sports uh, for both genders. Um, so there is a commitment uh, from youth in sport uh, to uh, help cricket develop uh, both boys' and girls' cricket. Uh, there is a, a real opportunity, I would imagine, uh, to do some more things around girls' cricket. Uh, women's cricket, of course, uh, is becoming increasingly more popular uh, around the world. Uh, our female athletes are, are just as proficient uh, with cricket as they are in other sports. Uh, but I would imagine, you know, one of the ways of, of getting uh, a cricket ball and a cricket bat uh, in the hands of, of more females is actually uh, to see the game becoming uh, socially uh, more available uh, kids falling in love with the game uh, more often. And the best way to do that, of course, is, is to see more cricket inside of our school system uh, and more cricket uh, played uh, out in the community, out in the backyards. And to you, Mr. Mendes. 
So I, I think that when we talk about cricket, it, the schools always take the rep for not playing cricket. I could say as the curriculum officer for PE and health in the schools that there is a curriculum with cricket in the schools. And I can say, and I've said it many times to a lot of our board uh, members, that cricket is played. The problem is, is getting them to play outside of school. Uh, we currently have a start the cricket season with Super 8s. We have something like 15 girls teams that play in that Super 8. And then we probably have about the same that play in our uh, 15 over or 20 over league matches. Um, the agenda for us now is trying to get the girls to play more cricket outside of schools. Um, COVID-19 in the last two years hasn't been, hasn't uh, helped us in trying to improve that. But I can say that that's the first, probably one of the first things on our agenda is to get more people playing cricket and in particular, more girls. So we, uh, our goal this year was to have a girls league, even if it's four or five teams. We're looking at trying to start up a female te team again as well. Um, but we have plans in place to do it, but we have to wait and see how COVID-19 pans out. Okay, thank you. I'm going to Mr. Collymore. This is coming from the international audience. COVID-19 is rising internationally, but they have looked at Grenada and it seems as Grenada is at a zero daily new cases rate, if that is accurate. What is Grenada doing to keep those numbers down? Um, thank you. Um, well, you know, we are in a global pandemic. So anyone that uh, has the low case numbers like Grenada, you know, the first thing we have to do is to say a prayer and, and thank mm -hmm. God because uh, it's, you know, you can do things, but, uh, it, you know, it's the almighty uh, at the end of the day that's, that's keeping us, us all safe. Um, I think that Grenada um, has the benefit of, um, had, having the benefit of very, very decisive action from the government. Um, those of us in the hotel industry, um, all of us did not um, necessarily like the action at the time, but it has proved to be the right action. And um, the, the, the government moved very, very swiftly. Grenada had one of the first lockdowns in the Caribbean and had one of the most extended lockdowns in the Caribbean. And, uh, and it has worked. And uh, it, the, 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 whenever there has been a, uh, a problem, the, the, the government has moved extremely fast in the same day in most cases to lock things down and then open it back up again when uh, we have, uh, uh, when, when you get uh, a sort of all clear, if you could even uh, say that word um, uh, in, in, in today's world. Um, but yeah, but I think we've been very, because of a very, very swift action, uh, we also have the benefit of St. George's University, which has assisted uh, uh, greatly in, um, uh, in, uh, in, in terms of our testing and, uh, and, and our protocols. And, and, uh, and, and also uh, what you have is a very, very compliant uh, population, people that care about the, uh, the, the fate of the country and, uh, and uh, and and, um, and 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 that's I think those are the things that, that work for us. Thank you. And wish to note that this this forum is exciting everyone online, but we have to respect the time of the the honourable persons here, including Mr. Collymore and others. Uh, we'll go another ten minutes if that's okay with everyone. It seems like we have to return again because a lot of questions are coming, but. Um, Going to Mr. Logie, big topic this week and coming up, the West Indies Cricket Board. The Middle Cricket Board is an associate member in the Americas, and we always look to our brothers who are a full test playing nation. The question is, what is the future of cricket in the region? And then we'll segue into what role does the West Indies Cricket Board play 
in keeping that at a high level? Well, I'm very optimistic that the future looks good for West Indies cricket. Um, we are producing quite a lot of quality young players, even though their preference now is a T20 format, which obviously um, is a bread and butter. Um, you know, what we'll be hoping that they, they also give some kind of preference to the 50 over and also the test match cricket. But I think we're doing pretty well at the moment. And that was because of a comprehensive overhaul over the last few years um, since Jimmy Adams came on board as director of cricket that they asked a simple question, you know, as to how can we improve the game in the Caribbean is about having a consistent approach throughout the Caribbean. We introduced the professional cricket league whereby each territory can then, you know, uh, engage two players from outside of the territory uh, to play for their national teams. Um, in Trinidad and Tobago, when I was coach of Trinidad and Tobago, we had two of the players, one from Barbados, the young Hope, Kai Hope, brother of Shai Hope. He came to Trinidad and Tobago. We had Primus there. We had um, one from Jamaica as well by the name of um, the fast bowler. His name escapes me now. But these are, these are some of the initiatives that were taken, and it has borne fruit. You know, we have seen an improvement in the quality of play, even though not at the same level that we would have liked, but it's a work in progress. And I think we have seen so many young players coming through over the last few years that it really, the future really looks good, you know, for the different formats. Um, Pollard is now captain of the super of the 50 over and T20 squad. And of course, young um, Braffitt has taken over now the test squad. And, you know, in the last possibly tour of Bangladesh, you saw them winning against the odds. And of course, now again, Sri Lanka seem to be doing pretty well at this point in time. So the future looks good. It just needs to be managed at the end of the day. For the Americas region, obviously, as COVID-19 took, took hold, we weren't able to bring in the America team into the Super 50. In fact, no, no foreign team came into that. I am certain that in the near future, there will be an opportunity for teams like Canada, teams like um, USA and even Bermuda. But on the same hand, it's very important that, you know, you have to make sure that your cricket is at a level that is going to be, you know, acceptable so that when the opportunity does present itself, that the, the players will be able to take, take, take it and run with it. I think improvement of the game on the island is going to be crucial. I think the opportunities will be there. I think in the next few months, you, your team should be in ICC tournament. So again, that preparation needs to take place now. And as I said before, I'm certain opportunities will be opening up in T20 leagues. CPL is there. That's another opportunity for players to look at. America is now opening up T20 leagues as well. Once the way is clear for international cricket again, I think the young players should be looking forward to opportunities, not only in the Caribbean, but elsewhere. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Collymore, this question is for you, if you can assist us. Uh, the question is, what are the pathways used in Grenada to develop high-performing international cricketers? Um, I think that the, um, the, the West Indies has a, has a, has a standard um, in terms of high-performance high development, and, and Gus will be able to, to speak to that more than, than I would. But one of the things that Grenada has, um, has, has worked for Grenada is the uh, village cricket. And, and that has inspired lots of, uh, has inspired, if you look at uh, all of the Grenada cricketers who have made the West Indies team, all of them have come out of the village um, cricket system. So, so that is, I think, more than anything, and this is, what, this is why I was speaking about that, if Caribbean islands must get youngsters in schools and, and, and out of schools, not just in schools and not just people with super talent. The average youngster, young people develop at different rates. And, and uh, there's some people that will show no talent at age 12 that will show a lot of talent at age 16 or 17. Um, and, and we have a system in the Caribbean which generally only favors the, the super talented kids and leaves the rest. We must get everybody playing cricket again. And uh, we must... We must socialize around cricket again. We, we, our socialization in the Caribbean is, uh, is too much focused on, on, uh, on fetting and, 
things that are not 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 that there's anything wrong with a fat gentleman. I I I I, I love it just as much as any Caribbean man. But please, so don't condemn me for saying that. But we must spend the day playing sports, and and, and what better sport to play than cricket rather than just liming and doing nothing. And I think that 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 will if if, if our leaders are able to get us back to that, then we'll have a healthier, more talented. Uh, population but Gus is, is able to speak much better than I can on high performance development. Thank you sir putting me on the spot. <laughs> oh, man high, high performance programs throughout the Caribbean now has taken on a different field. It's not just about cricket, it's about personal development of the individual. So it goes into so many other areas whereby professionals are coming in to speak to the young men on different topics, conflict resolution, uh, leadership roles, you know. Um, you know. So there are so many things that are happening now. Technology is something that is very important now in the cricket itself. So that is also taking up data, uh, how to use data to your advantage, a science-based approach to cricket, you know, the tactical side of the game, the technical side of the game. So a lot of things that are happening in the Caribbean now uh, takes on a lot of classroom setting as well, which is very important for the young man. So it's about making them aware, developing their, their mental capacity to deal with situations as it's real time, self-awareness, um, assessments. So there are a lot of things that are happening apart from the cricket inside of it as well. So what we are doing in the Caribbean or what we have done over the years is to really and truly try to, to have a personal development program that will certainly have a well-grounded, well-rounded individuals so that when they do leave those set up, they are not only good at cricket, but they're good at most things that are around the game itself. And at the end of it, they raise their self-confidence, their self-esteem. And sometimes we see it manifest itself out there in the middle. It might sound to some people and look to some people as a bit of arrogance, but at the end of it is, is the self-confidence that they have gained from some of these high performance programs. Thank you. As we go into our final five minutes, we'll go to our president, Mr. Mendes. You have one minute. Um, the question is, where do you see Bermuda cricket in 2025 and beyond? So in three years time, as you come to a close of your first term, where do you see Bermuda? cricket board heading to? Oh, that first time will be three years into our, hopefully three years into our strategic plan and hopefully the um, focus points that we are going to address, hang on a minute, the um, focus points that we're going to address um, will be three years in and hopefully we will see some type of um, improvement. But Gus hit the point, hit the nail on the head with the way our high performance is, but we have to get more kids, youngsters playing cricket, both boys and girls. And hopefully by my end of my tenure, we should be maybe five rankings ahead of where we are now, which, which will secure us more funds from the ICC. Okay. Thank you. Honorable Premier, thank you for joining us this evening as we close out. Um, the question to you would be, Government provides sufficient funds to many national sports governing body and football and cricket being the two national national sports through cabinet, parliament. Um, are there any plans to aid them even more as they are having some success on the international arena? Um, at this time, I'm not entirely certain with constrained budgets that there is um, a, an ability to do more. But the one thing that we'll do is to continue to support. Um, we've given... Uh, support not only to the cricket team recently when they had their international matches, but also to our football team when they're the matches and we can see the funding and the support of which we've given to many community clubs around the country, including four cricket clubs. So that work will continue um, and it's important to continue to invest um, in uh, those uh, in, in sport in general. So uh, there are I know that the Minister of Youth Culture and Sport is a sportsman himself. And the desire is to continue to support sport and continue to invest in sport. And that's the only way that you can see a return. Thank you. And to Mr. Collymore, thank you for having joined us. Question would be, could we see some competition between Grenada and Bermuda, even though Grenada is part of the West Indies national team components players, or could we see some direct competition between Bermuda and Grenada at youth or senior level, even women and girls? 
I think that uh, we, sh I, you know, out of COVID, I think that uh, one of the tragedies of the COVID is is the demise of Liat and uh, an intrusion of travel and. Uh, and I, I really feel that there needs to be a catalyst to bring the Caribbean together again. And cricket may just be that catalyst. Uh, yeah. Liat has, uh, has, has, has fallen, but the West Indies cricket team has risen in COVID times. And uh, cricket may just be the thing to bring us together again. And, and uh, I think we need to look at our legends, our past players, our legacy with cricket and realize that uh, we have a common bond through cricket and, and we beat the world together through cricket. And, and uh, whether it's Grenada playing Bermuda, hopefully, and, or, or Bermuda playing some other island, I uh, really think that um, you know, the, the, the leadership uh, of the Caribbean needs to look at bringing the region together again um, through, through cricket. Yes, so thank you very much. This one again to Mr. Logie. It has been brought to our attention that you are actually on the beautiful island of Bermuda. <laughs> yes, crashing. I am. Yes. Welcome back. So Thank you very much. Here, since you took us to our only World Cup appearance and you are on island, are you willing or able to assist the Bermuda Cricket Board to reach those heights again immediately? Well, I'll have to ask my wife that. <laughs> but certainly, certainly, once I'm here, I'll be happy to lend whatever support I can. And I'm certain that um, that's possible. No two ways about it. Um, we are all in this together. And I'm certain that, you know, whatever support I can give, you know, whatever knowledge I can share, I am certainly happy to do so. Thank you. And to the Honorable Minister of Youth, Culture and Sports, Dr. Pete, um, just checking, do you have audio? I do, thank okay. you. Thank you very much. As the Minister of Youth, Culture and Sports, everything we talked about falls directly in your office. And where do you see youth, culture and sports as a new minister? And where would you like for it to end once you've actually finished your term, whenever that may be? I, I can tell you uh, from day one uh, of being here in the office, uh, the passion that the staff have for the development of the sport um, is unparalleled. Um, so for me, it doesn't really matter who the minister is, the staff here at Ethan Sport and here at Ministry Headquarters, they're, they're, they come to work focused every single day trying to do their level best to try to promote and, and grow sport. Of course, resources are always uh, complicated uh, given the fact that we're in a pandemic but the commitment to develop sport um, has not diminished. Uh, for the time that, um, that I'm here uh, in the ministry office, you know, what I would like to accomplish, of course, um, is probably two things. One is to, to, to elevate and promote uh, sport. Uh, for example, we're talking about cricket today, of course, is I wouldn't want to leave the office uh, without uh, doing something tangible uh, to really push uh, the promotion of cricket a little further along. Uh, but generically speaking, uh, as it relates to some commitments here, uh, at least from my point of view in the minister's office, is to do something to try to improve the infrastructure for sport. So, you know, we did talk a little bit on the call today about, you know, our playing surfaces, uh, you know, and the environment in which we need to uh, produce uh, talented elite athletes. A lot of that, of course, is, is, is attached to uh, infrastructure, you know, pitches, fields, batting cages, uh, things of those, those nature. Those things are fundamental in the growth and development of athletes. And it'll be, it'll be remiss of me if I didn't have an opportunity to try to improve those things. Thank you. And as we finalize this first webinar, I'll hand it over to our president, Mr. Arnold Mendes, to close us out with some final remarks. You're muted, Arnold. It's been a good webinar. And first of all, I'd like to thank our um, Assistant Secretary and Treasurer, uh, Mr. Stephen Douglas, for bringing that idea up and for us to have this very special conversation with some very special people. I'd like to thank the Premier, the Honorable David Burke, um, for sharing his desire and, what should I say, passion about cricket as long as the Minister of Youth, Culture and Sports, uh, we had a meeting with him earlier today. 
there's a lot of positivity coming from out of that. But if you, I just want to thank everybody for being here. Um, Gus, uh, yeah, we're looking to try and get something done with him so that we can get back to uh, the way we were as an associate country. Bermuda has a steep history of cricket. Uh, we've had some outstanding achievements. So with the assistance from government and the sponsors from outside, corporate sponsors, um, the future looks bright. So I want to just thank everybody, in particular, Mr. Collymore and Mr. Phillips for sharing your information from Grenada. Um, and hopefully we can get some post-COVID-19, get some match between Grenada and uh, Bermuda. But I just want to thank everybody for participating and I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Yes, and on behalf of the Bermuda Cricket Board, we wish to thank our esteemed guest panelists. Once again, thank you very much, Honorable Premier. Could I just say one thing to all of the people who are listening? Thank you for inviting me. And please, a reminder to every single person who's watching locally, please do not mix. There's a situation going on. And unlike Barry, where um, there are zero cases, there are not zero cases here in Bermuda. Please, please, please do not mix and be mindful and follow the public health protocols. This is very important. There are now people in the hospital. This is important. Thank you. Thank you. And on behalf of Mr. Cricket Boy, we should thank the Honorable Premier once again, the Honorable Minister Peets, Mr. Gus Logie. Can we be remiss not to mention the Honorable Dr. Keith Mitchell? Thank, thank you, Mr. Carly Moore, for having joined us. And we say to all of Bermuda, you know, be safe, be mindful, respect each other, and look out for more valuable webinar sessions from the Bermuda Cricket Board. To all, have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.